weeks. But today I want to begin in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in the 19th verse. It says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you have a Bible, lift it toward heaven right now. Father, bless this word. Anoint this word. God, release this word into the hearts and into the minds and into the ears of your sons and daughters. God, make us stronger, make us wiser, make us more equipped, make us sharp because of your word. Oh, there are people carrying dull, dull, dull swords in the kingdom of heaven. Lord, sharpen those swords by the power of your gospel today. Lord, give us a double-edged sword that we may be able to destroy all the works of the adversary. Lord, we know heaven and earth will pass away, but what I hold in my hand, it will endure forever. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord today. This is a a powerful passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. Obviously, he talks about uh, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of the Lamb. I mean, you know, in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, it was only the high priest, it was only the priest designated that could go beyond the veil and enter into the Holy of Holies, which is where they encountered the presence of God. But because of the blood of Jesus, because of his battle on the cross, because of his success in resurrection, how many understand we're no longer under the first dispensation, we're under a new dispensation which means now you don't have to be a high priest to enter the Holy of Holies. You as a child of God can enter into the holy place through the the blood of Jesus Christ. You get to access the presence of God. This is the new dispensation. Jesus is now the high priest over the house of God. But the preaching that goes on today in our culture and in our society is to almost intentionally diminish the importance of coming to the house of God. It's almost as if the attitude today is, well, I'm the church. I don't need to go to church. I'm, we are the church. And how many understand? That's not entirely incorrect because you and I are the church. But we cannot disqualify the fact that God still wants us to come together. God wants us to gather. There there is a gathering principle that you see in the Scripture and especially in the New Testament. And in fact, the Hebrew writer here tells us that we are to hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful and we're supposed to consider one another. So in other words, when we gather, when we come together, we come together to consider one another. In other words, how many understand you need to have accountability? Every one of us should have accountability in our life. When you begin to live your life with no accountability, you begin to set yourself up for dangerous situations in your life. But when you have an accountability structure, how many understand accountability gets you back on track? 
Accountability makes you aware when you weren't aware that you were straying off track. Uh, Everybody needs accountability. I don't care if you're an apostle, a bishop, a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist. Uh, I don't care if you you serve anywhere in the house of God, if you just attend a a worship center. Everybody needs accountability. And this is what the Hebrew writer is saying, that we are to consider one another. In other words, we're to stir up one another in love. We're to stir up one another to do good works in the kingdom of God. And then he emphatically says, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Now, how many understand this is about as New Testament as you can get? He's he's talking about the old dispensations gone. He's talking about the new dispensations come. He's talking about the importance of the shed blood of Jesus, that Jesus is the high priest. Uh, This is all post-resurrection. Are you hearing me? This this, this is not an Old Testament principle. This uh, This is not an Old Testament principle. This is a New Testament principle. And we're to come together. We're to gather. He says, not forsaking the assembly together. We're supposed to come together. And when we come together, we hold each other accountable. We we pour love out on each other. We stir each other up to do good works. Uh, we, we, We have to understand the importance of coming together. And we need to understand that when you look at Jesus' life for 30 years, Jesus sat in the synagogue, the house of God. And he waited for the appointed time of his father to release him into full-time ministry. How many know Jesus' active ministry was only three and a half years on this earth? He wasn't released into ministry till he was 30 years old. Uh, he died on that cross on Calvary when he was about 33 and a half years old. Uh, so for 30 years before that, he sat in the house of God uh, and he waited for the appointed time of God. Uh, in fact, the very first words uh, that come out of his mouth uh, are recorded in Luke chapter 2 verse 49. Uh, And it says uh, that Jesus said to to Mary and Joseph, he said to them, why did you seek me when they lost him? Uh, He said, did you not know that I must be about my father's business? When you have a bad attitude about the church, when you have a bad perception about worship centers, about the church gathering together, you're being deceived by the enemy. When you have a bad attitude about coming together, you're allowing the enemy to sift you from something that is dear and near to the heart of God. And Jesus said, you should have known where I was at. You should have known I was about my father's business. When they lost him and they went back to find him, they should have found him easy because he was right where he was supposed to be. If they would have went straight to the house of God, they would have found Jesus there. He understood the The Bible says that that this was his regiment. Uh, This was how he conducted his life. Uh, And what does he do? He immediately, when he begins his ministry, he immediately begins to gather his team. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Uh, then he said to them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Uh, in John 1, 43, it says, The following day Jesus uh, wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip, and he said to him, Follow me. Uh, In Matthew chapter 8, a certain scribe said, Master, I'll follow you wherever you go. Uh, Another said, Let me follow you, but let me first uh, go and bury my father. And Jesus rebuked him. He said, If you're going to follow me, then you got to let the dead bury their own dead. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, as the Bible says, as Jesus passed from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose, and he followed him. 
So what's Jesus doing? Before he began his ministry, he assembled, he gathered in the house of God. When he began his ministry, what did he do? He began gathering his team. He began calling forth Simon Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the son of James, and even Judas, the betrayer. Come on, somebody. He began to gather his team. And the 12 were amazingly uh, 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 a variety of uh, uh, personalities, you might say. In fact, their interest uh, were broad and wide. Uh, four of them were fishermen. Uh, they were two sets of brothers. They came from the same community, and they had apparently all been friends for a long time because they knew each other. One was a tax collector. He was a loner. One was a zealot. He was a political advocate, but he remained alone. The other six came from diverse occupations. And for three and a half years, what did Jesus do? He gathered them. For three and a half years, what did he do? He called them together. For three and a half years, they came together, whether it was in the wilderness, whether it was on a mountaintop, whether it was by the lake, whether it was on a borrowed boat. Are you hearing me? They came together. And for three and a half years, uh, they gathered and Jesus taught them. Uh, he taught in parables. Uh, he gathered with them uh, and they kept uh, and they celebrated the holy festivals together. He gathered them uh, and when he gathered them, he went into the synagogue with them. Uh, in other words, they went to church together. Come on, somebody. In gathering, he showed them. Watch this. When he brought them together, he showed them how to love like nobody could love. When he brought them together, he taught them how to have compassion uh, for those that were less fortunate than they were. When he brought them together, he taught them how to heal, uh, how to lay their hands on the sick uh, and administer healing to those that needed a touch. Uh, when he gathered them, uh, he performed miracles with them everywhere they went. When he gathered them, uh, they cast out devils. Uh, do you see how important it is uh, for the church to come together and gather? See, we, 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 you have to understand, though, we don't come to gather as a social country club. Church is never meant to be a social country club gathering. We don't gather to promote your business. To how can I network and build my business? That's not what church is all about. Uh, when we come together, we're supposed to stir one another in accountability. Uh, we stir each other up in love. Uh, we stir each other up in good works in the community. In other words, we help bandage and put each other back together when we've fallen uh, and when we made mistakes. Uh, we're there to be iron sharpening iron. Uh, we're there to build each other up. Uh, Help put each other back together. That's why we gather so we can love like nobody's ever loved. Show compassion like compassion has never been given. Heal, perform miracles, and even whoop up on the devil when the devil needs whooped up on. That's why we come together so we can go out and scatter into the community. Oh, come on. If you believe it, you better shout in here. I'm just laying foundation today. Is that okay? Can't build a house without a foundation. <laughs> Let me just build the foundation on this Sunday, and I'll preach to you on another Sunday. Amen? John 14, 12 through 16, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, who's he talking about? The ones he gathered. The ones he called. The ones he hand-selected. He said, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So now Jesus says, look, just because I'm leaving doesn't mean the work we've started ends. Jesus said, just because I'm departing, just because I'm fulfilling the Father's will, doesn't mean now everything you've been taught goes to waste. Everything I've imparted into you goes out the window. No, no, no. How many understand? It's never wrong to love. And it's never wrong to love unconditionally. It's never wrong to love with the attitude that I'm going to love people no matter what. It's never wrong to have compassion for people, even when you think they're not deserving of it. All people deserve compassion. 
It's never wrong to have boldness to heal the sick. Listen to me. If you're intimidated to lay hands on a sick body, you better get some faith in you. Because the Bible says if you lay hands on them, they're going to recover. Jesus said, everything you saw me do is being transferred upon you. Now, if the church stops gathering, what happens? The power and effectiveness of what he transferred to us becomes weakened. Oh, I can, I can be fine on my own. That's, that's Satan's trap. Satan wants you to believe that you are better by yourself, and that is not true. You are better together with other believers. You've never been better by yourself. You were by yourself before you found God, and look what it did for you. Got you nowhere on a nowhere train. Come on, somebody. But when you got, when you got grafted into the family of God, when you got grafted into, into the kingdom of God, when you got around some other faith believers, some, some faith talkers, are you hearing me? All of a sudden, it does something to you. Uh, and listen to me. We are stronger and better together. We can't neglect gathering. We have to come together because the works he did, he's depending on us to continue those works, but even do greater works than he did. In other words, the newspapers ought to be full of miracles. The newscasts ought to be full of miracles. Word ought to be going out through the community that, hey, there's a church that's alive. There's a church that still believes in the commandments and believes in the power of God. There is a church that's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. There's a church that refuses to lay down and die. There is a church that when they, everywhere they go, some snap, crackle, and pop is happening. Now watch this, in Scripture, after the resurrection, the next great event that happened was the day of Pentecost. And that's in the second chapter of the book of Acts. Now, now listen, there is Pentecost Sunday, and I'll preach something on Pentecost Sunday. That's 50 days after the resurrection is when Pentecost happened, and we celebrated in, in our natural uh, culture Pentecost Sunday. But I want to take you there and show you something, because it was one of the supremely great days of the Christian church. In fact, uh, on that day, the Holy Spirit came and started the Christian church in a special way. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Again, I'm laying foundation. you got to let me lay the foundation this Sunday. Acts 1, 4 and 5, it says, And being assembled, what were they? They weren't at home by themselves? That can't be right. Come on. This dang New Testament? <laughs> And being assembled together, not home aloneer, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So what does he tell them? He, he, this, is, this is in his, you know, Jesus was on earth 40 days after his resurrection before he ascended and took his rightful place at the right hand of the throne of God. He made many appearances in that 40-day window, uh, affirming and confirming his resurrection. And here he's speaking to his team that he recruited. He said, we're, we're, we're going to continue gathering. And he said, I want you to gather. And I want you to wait for the promise to come upon you. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, this is what happened. They were assembled together. They were gathering in an upper room. They were gathering in one place under one roof. Uh, they weren't using Zoom technology. They weren't FaceTiming each other. Are you hearing me? They, they weren't live streaming. Come on, somebody. But, but, Pastor, they would have if they would have had, but they weren't. Come on. They weren't using that technology. They were together. They didn't have cans with a, with a piece of yarn or string. Come on, listening through the window. Come on. They weren't using walkie-talkies. They were all gathered together under one roof, uh, assembled. Uh, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. In other words, every one of them got their touch. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, 
And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to them, uh, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear them, each of them in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, as the parts of Libya joining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? And others began mocking, saying they are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice, and he said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk like you think they're drunk. Come on, somebody. He he wasn't denying they weren't drunk. They're acting different. Come on, somebody. You you know drunk folk when you get around them. He didn't say they weren't drunk. He just said they're not drunk like you think they are. Since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, what you need to understand is from Genesis to the resurrection up to the day of Pentecost, there was no church like you and I know church. They gathered in synagogue. In other words, there was religion, but there was no church. They didn't gather like we do. There there was hypocrisy, but there was never any forgiveness given. There was a form, but there was no people in relationship with God or even the Son of God. But Jesus said something so profound in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He said, and I also say to you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I said something on Wednesday night to those that were you listening. There's something in the Bible called the law of first mention. Amen? Did you catch that on Wednesday night? If you didn't, you missed a great, you missed a great message. I'm just got to pat myself on the back. <laughs> there's, a law, there's a law of first mention. Now, it might surprise you that this is the first time the word church is mentioned in the Scripture. And it's right here when Jesus is looking at Simon Peter saying, and I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now this word church that Jesus used is translated out of the Greek and the Greek word is ecclesia. Now listen to this definition. If ecclesia is a calling out, what did Jesus do with his disciples? He called them out. He called them out of fishing, out of tax collecting, out of their political careers. He called them out. Uh, that, that, that's what the word church means, that Jesus was you. It was a calling out. Uh, when you dig a little deeper, it also means a popular meeting, especially of a congregation. It means a gathering. Did you catch that? A gathering. Somebody say gathering. A gathering of citizens called out from their homes into the same public place. It also means the whole body of Christians, watch this, scattered throughout the earth. So we are supposed to gather so we can scatter. And the reason the church isn't as effective as it needs to be because we've forsaken the gathering and have only tried the scattering. But our scattering is without power and effectiveness until we learn to first gather. But if we put the gathering back in the church, you better watch out, world, when we begin to scatter once again. We're going to see signs, wonders, and miracles happen all throughout the earth. If you believe it, shout yes. See, it's funny, there's a whole breed and generation of preachers now, they want to pick and choose how and what they teach. 
They, 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 they want to they wanna skim it. They want to give skim milk and cookies to the believers as if the believers can't handle the meat of the word. Uh, they they want to pick what fits their rebellious lifestyle, what fits their immoral thinking. Uh, preachers want to want to pick and choose the word uh, that, that fashions uh, the way they want to live their life. Uh, but listen to me. Uh, there's only one way that is right, and it is the way God meant it for each and every one of us. Uh, and God means us to come together for Taking not uh, the assembly together of the believers. Uh, we've got to rise up uh, even in the midst of difficult times. Uh, you don't think it was difficult for the disciples? Jesus had just been crucified. Uh, Jesus had just been destroyed. Uh, pandemonium had broken out in the community, but Jesus came to them. Uh, he said, don't you leave. Don't you scatter just quite yet. Uh, you've got to gather together in the upper room uh, and wait for the promise to come upon your life. And what did they do? They gathered before they scattered. The enemy tried to get them to scatter. But when we gather and get what God has for us, everywhere we go, we take the light of God's kingdom into the darkest places of the earth. Everywhere we go, we preserve the earth with the salt of the earth. Everywhere we go, things begin to happen because we've been together. We've been imparting the love, the compassion, the principles of the kingdom of God that when we go we're ready to make a difference everywhere we go they waited in difficult times and the power of the Holy Spirit came upon not one of them but every one of them got a touch from up on high see I live for the day that when we all come to church we all get a blessing on our life when we all gather together we all get stirred down deep it's like fire in our bones not one of us leaves defeated. Not one of us leaves discouraged. Not one of us leaves overwhelmed with shame. But when we all leave, we're ready to make a difference everywhere we go. Oh, look at your neighbors say, we have to gather so we can scatter. Oh, I just, I just... I just do the scatter part, Pastor. I'm okay. <laughs> well, even your car has to go back to the filling station. Are you hearing me? Even your lazy booty has to go to the grocery store. <laughs> even your body says, I'm hungry. Yo, I haven't eaten in three hours. Everything has to be refilled. Everything has to be refilled. Even if you're Elon Musk friends and you buy a Tesla, you better find a charging station. That battery's got to be refilled. Everything has to be refilled. And the erroneous teaching that's taking place by people that have been offended, people that have been hurt, People that have become haughty, people that have become prideful and arrogant, that erroneous teaching is robbing the church of their power and effectiveness. If a car has to go back to be refueled and to recharge, how much more do we have to come back to the place that refuels us and recharges us? If my body... If my body needs Dairy Queen in the morning, Burger King at noon, and White Castle in the evening, how much more does my spirit man need to get back in the house of God? How much more do we've got to get back to the place that builds us and equips us and strengthens us but, 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 but I've been hurt in church. You got hurt at home too. But, but, but I've been hurt in church. You got hurt at work. But I got hurt. I got hurt in church. You stubbed your toe looking for the remote. Stop blaming the church.
But you know what? That all plays right into the enemy's tactics. The Bible says if you remove the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. And listen to me. There are two entities after your scatter. The enemy wants you to be scattered with no power. But God's desire is that we gather so when we scatter, we have power everywhere we go. Oh, come on. I'm laying a good foundation today. Ecclesia is a calling out. Aren't you glad God found you and he called you? Aren't you glad God didn't disqualify you when he found you, but when he found you, he saw a diamond in the rough. When God found you, he saw something he could use, something he could work with. When God found you, he didn't give up on you. He called you out. How many you thankful for this place? become a popular meeting place for us as a congregation to gather and to be refueled spiritually, that we are a gathering of citizens called out of our homes. And when we come together, something happens. All of a sudden, we as the whole body of Christians are prepared to be scattered throughout the earth to make a difference. And this is why the writer in Hebrews 10, 24 said, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, uh, but we are to exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what the day approaching is? It's the day of judgment. If you want to get real mad at me, read the next few verses. <laughs> Amen. I'm not preaching on that today, but you want to get real mad, read the next few verses to see what it says. It says you can't keep on sinning. Because if you keep on sinning after the resurrection, you make his resurrection of no effect. That's scripture. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you and I coming together to a place by the power and leading of the Holy Spirit that when we go wherever we go, we don't all live on the same street. We don't all attend the same uh, community events. We don't all go to the same grocery stores. We don't all have the same employer. We go in many different directions. We don't just go to the north, south, east, and west. Uh, some of us go southwest and northwest. Are you hearing me? We go in every direction when we, after we leave this place. And how you know, when we leave, we ought to leave with power and authority. When we leave, we ought to have the dominion of the, of, of the Father upon our life everywhere we go. And that's why accountability is okay. I've learned a long time ago, I'm okay. I'm okay with people that have succeeded and people that have overcome and people that, that have made it through tough seasons. I'm okay with people looking me in the eye and saying, Raymond, you got to work on this. Raymond, you got to change. Even Brody's baseball coach looked at him and said, this ain't T-ball anymore, boys. If you want to play T-ball, let me register you back to T-ball. Saying, but you're playing baseball now. It's okay to have another believer look at you and say, if you keep going in this direction, you're headed for trouble. It's okay to have the crutches kicked out from under your arm. It's okay to have accountability. It's okay to be stirred up with love. To me, that's true love. If you're a parent and you have a rebellious child and all you do is keep feeding that rebellion, you're not showing true love to that child. But when you have a rebellious child and you're willing to address them head on and address the issues, you know what you're doing? You're loving that child to be successful into their future. And the mentality today is we, we just can't tell people. No, 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 that's not what the Bible tells us. The Bible says we've got to stir one another unto love. Why? Because we'll never do the good works God has empowered us to do until we have been realigned. That's what it's all about. And when the day of Pentecost happened, many people thought it, that the book of Acts was the gospel of the Holy Spirit. I understand that's not what it was. The Holy Spirit was at work. But before we turn to the details, we need to understand, really, 
what the book of Acts is all about because the book of Acts is about the birth of the church. It's about the church being birthed. Uh, it, it, it is about the church coming into its existence. Uh, and the Holy Spirit came to put power on the church. Uh, in the beginning, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Uh, we understand that man is a spirit that lives in a body and possesses a soul. Uh, we understand that the Spirit of God uh, moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, we understand that Joseph was a man in whom the Spirit of God was. Uh, Joshua was a man in whom the Spirit was. Uh, the prophets spoke how? By the Spirit of God when they opened their mouth. Uh, Ezekiel said, the hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and sent me down into the midst of a valley which was full of bones. And then he began to prophesy by the power of the Holy Spirit. All biblical authorities are inspired by the Holy Spirit. Jesus, how many understand? He was led by what? By the Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And Pentecost was not the birth of the Spirit. The Spirit of God has always been in the Scriptures, all through the Old Testament, into the New Testament. That's not what the day of Pentecost was all about. The day of Pentecost was about the Holy Spirit giving birth and empowering the church. It was about those that were called out, those that had gathered together, those that had come together intentionally, organized under one roof, getting an impartation upon their life to live a free, and powerful life everywhere you go. That's what the day of Pentecost is all about. Pentecost was a calling out of an assembly. And in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 to 49, it says, Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things behold I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high well see there it is pastor from, from the day of Pentecost they scattered and we've never meant to be gathered again <laughs> Then let me ask you a question. Why did Paul write to a group of Romans known as the church? Why did Paul write to a group of Corinthians known as the church? Why did Paul write to a group of Galatians known as the church? Why did Paul write to a, the, a group of Ephesians known as a church? Why did Paul write to the Philippians, a, a group of people known as the church? Why did Paul write to the Colossians, a group of people known as the church? Why did he write to the Thessalonians, a, a group of people known as the church? How I many understand those biblical accounts came after the day of Pentecost? But Paul wrote to people that gathered together in the name of Christ and became the church in their community. Why did they come together so they could be effective wherever they lived? If coming together is not legitimate, why did Jesus himself write letters in the book of Revelation and pin those letters to the angel? Do you know I'm an angel, y'all? To the pastors of a church, a called out, gathered body of believers in Ephesus, in Smyrna, in per Paragamos, in Thyatira, in Sardis, in Philadelphia, and in Laodicea. Why did he write to specific body of believers? Because there were people still gathering and coming together. Why was it when Peter was imprisoned and, 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 they, and, they, and, they, and the women all got together, they had an all-night prayer meeting? I mean, you know, they were in one place together praying for Peter to be released from prison. Why were they all gathering together? Because there's power when we gather. Jesus said, when two or more come together in my name, he said, there I am in the midst of you. God says, when you lift my name up, I inhabit the praises of my people. There is power 
power when we come together. Iron sharpens iron. When we come together, we're like a three-stranded cord that can't easily be broken. See, I'm afraid the church is losing its power because we've lost the importance of gathering and coming back together. But I've got news for the devil. COVID-19 has wrecked enough havoc on the body of Christ for way too long. And it's time for us to get back together so we can be about the Father's business. Oh, come on. If you believe it, you better praise him in here. The book of Acts. The book of Acts, something began to happen. In the book of Acts, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, the birth of, of the church began to happen. And what did they do? They started scattering. But they first had gathered. And when they began to scatter all of the something, signs and wonders, salvations and baptisms and miracles begin to happen. Do you know you don't have to be an ordained minister to baptize somebody? Look at your neighbor and say, say what? <laughs> you, you don't have to be an ordained minister to baptize somebody. You know what you need to baptize somebody? You need to offer hope in the gospel. And when a repented heart receives Christ as their Lord and Savior, just find you some water and baptize them in the name of Jesus. Just say you are buried with him in baptism and raised up to walk in a newness of life. When they baptized in the book of Acts, they didn't say we're having sign-ups tomorrow. And we're having a class on Wednesday night. And uh, don't wear white garments. You know, their seat, they, they didn't go through all these protocols. They didn't say, Tyler, fill up the baptistry Saturday. Right, make sure it's 80 degrees, comfortable. Don't want it to be too cold when they get to Make sure we have towels and slippers uh, and those little stickums on the steps so nobody slips and falls. Uh, it, it wasn't all this protocol. You know when they baptized, the minute they got saved, they found some water, baptized them in the name of Jesus, and they began to live their new life. What's that? That's the church being scattered with power everywhere they go. You know why you wear your pastors out? You put all the responsibility on them. It's a pastor's job to get people to church. It's a pastor's job to get people to act right. It's a pastor's job to do. It's a pastor's job. It's a pa and, and, you know, pastors are wore out. Pastors got less hair than they started with. Their, road their wardrobe's a little bigger than the one they started with. Come on, somebody. Pastors are all wore out. Pastors got wrinkles. They didn't think they were places. They didn't think they could have wrinkles on their body. Pastors, pastors are wore out because y'all making the pastors do all the work. Listen to me. We're all the body of Christ. I'm just your head cheerleader when we come together. But you know what? You should be a cheerleader to the person that's sitting next to you. I'm just the head cheerleader when you come. I'm just the, the worship team. They're just the head cheerleaders who encourage you to get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your, your shy self and open up your mouth and give God all that he deserves. You and I are called together. When, when somebody sits next to you, they ought to leave a better person because all of the power and glory that's on you gets all over them and it begins to spread like wildfire that's how the kingdom of heaven was meant to be how many understand uh, they started they started with 12 but in the upper room there was 120 so the 12 turned into 120 that means the 12 are responsible for adding 10 people each to the upper room gathering the 120 turned into 3,000. Why? Because at Peter's first sermon, when he said, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is just the fulfillment of what Joel the prophet said, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters, your maidservants, your old men and, and old women, all are going to get the power of the Holy Ghost. He just said they are intoxicated by the Holy Ghost. The reason they're talking different is because they've got a, a new empowerment upon their life. Uh, the reason they're acting different uh, is because they have a new empowerment upon their life. Uh, and then he preached his first sermon and 3,000 souls were added to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so now the 120 turned into 3,000. Uh, so that means the 120 were each responsible for adding 25 souls to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, are you seeing how this thing works? Uh, and the reason if our scattering is not effective, uh, we need 
to take our gathering more serious. If what we're doing out there isn't making a dent, we've got to be more serious when we come together. If what we're doing out there isn't making hell nervous, we've got to be more serious when we come together as the body of Christ. Because everywhere we go, people ought to talk different. Everywhere we go, people ought to act different. Everywhere we go, people ought to want to be a part of the body of Christ. Everywhere we go, we ought to command change like the world has never known and never seen. Come on, if you believe it, help me praise him in here today. See, and that's why the disciples became apostles. In other words, they started gathering teams. They started recruiting people unto good works. And from disciples to apostles came the church in Rome, came the church in Corinth, came the church in Galatia, came the church in Ephesus, in Philippi, in Colossa, in Thessalonia, came the church in Smyrna, in Paragamos, in Thyatira, in Sardis, and even in Philadelphia and Laodicea. Churches begin to abound. Gathering places of those that have been called out of their homes. Not just so we can get a feel-good service, but so we could be in empowered and changed and transformed that when we scatter this time we're going to make a permanent impact everywhere we go how many want to make life changing impacts everywhere we go that's what it's all about I want you to stand with me all over this room right now listen to me I don't want to gather just to gather I don't want to gather just to gather I don't want to come together just to come together. I don't ever want to be a social club. If you want to gather, there are clubs you can join and be social gatherings. That's not the church. But it doesn't mean you have to be unsocial. It doesn't mean you lose your love and lose your compassion. And lose the things that you've been taught through the Holy Scriptures. Jesus kept teaching. He kept teaching. He taught in parables so they would understand exactly what he was saying. He kept celebrating with them all of the festivals. They came together and they observed the festivals and what they symbolized and what they meant. It's appropriate for us to come together. It's appropriate for us to celebrate in all the festivals that are attached to the life of Jesus Christ. It's appropriate for us to come together and be serious with our walk with God. We need to take our salvation serious. We need to take the price that was paid for our salvation serious. It was a gift that God gave you. It was a gift. And none of us in this room, none of us listening online, none of us deserve that gift, but God gave it anyway. He gave you a gift that you did not deserve. We need not trample on that gift. Jesus didn't die so you can sin. He died to forgive you of your sins. Jesus didn't die so you could just fumble through life. He died so you could have power to be successful everywhere you go in life. And I pray that through this series, I pray that through this series, it opens up your eyes and it opens up your heart and it stirs up a desire in you to be a witness everywhere you go. My prayer is that there's something in you that says, I'm not coming to the house of God empty-handed. I'm not just bringing me and my family. I've got to bring, who are the 10 God maybe puts on your heart this year? Maybe 10 people this year that you intentionally begin to share the love and the principles and the compassion of God. Who are the 10 Maybe we get into a season that now nah, nah, you're so bold in God. Who are the 25 you, you begin to connect with? Listen to me. You, that's where real ministry is. People are always saying, I want my, when am I going to get my ministry? When my, my min your ministry is every day you walk out of your house. We used to have painted on the backside of the church in Lexington. We had a long driveway uh, that wound down the seven acres where our church was. And on the back of the marquee sign where it said Word of Life Church on the front, on the back, we, we painted in bold letters, you are now entering your mission field. 
And do you realize that every day you leave church, every day you leave your home, you're entering into the missionville? Do you have what you need that when you scatter, you can be effective everywhere you go? And this is why we come together. And this is, why, uh, this is why we make available to you the tools we do, uh, the Zoom Bible studies, uh, the live streaming technology. It's not meant to replace us coming together. It's to aid you through a pandemic. Uh, but listen to me, we can't rely on those tools. we got to come together. There's something that happens when we come together. There's something when we praise together. There's something when we pray together. There's something when we believe together. There's something when we receive together. Something powerful happens. Uh, if one one can put a thousand to fly. Two can chase ten thousand to fly. We become effective everywhere we go. My job, my job is to make available the tools you need to be effective. That's what my job is. My job is to stir you, to encourage you. My job is to hold you accountable. And my prayer is that you do the same to the next generation. It's not the church's responsibility to teach your children about Jesus and to teach them how to live their life. We, we offer that as a tool in Sunday school, but parents, it's your job at home to infuse those principles into their life. And I'm going to be hitting hard on this the next few Sundays and even on Wednesday nights because I heard in my spirit a few Sundays ago, I heard in my spirit, we've got to gather so we can scatter. How many of you ready to see God do things we haven't ever seen Him do? Praise God. With every head bowed and every eye closed right now, if you'd say, Pastor, I've got to rearrange, I've got to reorchestrate some things in my life. I've got to get some shifting in my mindset, some attitude adjustments in my pers perspective of the church as a whole. Uh, then this message was for you today. This is about bringing us in proper alignment because we're all on the same team. We're all in this together. We're better together. We're in this together. We're fighting together. And I don't know who needs a change and an adjustment, uh, but this is for you today. Just lift your hand up toward heaven wherever you're at right now. God bless you. 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 Uh, God bless you. God bless you. God sees those hands. Uh, my God, God sees that hand. God bless you all the way in the back. Uh, praise God by faith. God sees those hands at home. Uh, those of you that are watching from the comfort of your home, uh, God sees that hand. God bless you. Uh, God bless you. Come on, somebody ought to give God some praise right now. Come on, put your hands over your heart right now. Put your hands over your heart. Father, I pray. I pray over your sons and your daughters. I pray over your called out ones. You called each and every one uh, at a certain time in their life. Uh, you've called, you've tugged on the heart strings of their, the strings of their heart. And God, I pray right now as you begin to saturate them, uh, saturate them by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, cause them to speak with new tongues. Cause them to speak different than they've been speaking. Uh, if they spoke with a tongue of neg ne negativity, cause them to speak with a tongue of positivity. Uh, if they spoke with a tongue of fear, cause them to speak uh, with a tongue of faith. Uh, if they spoke with a, t a tongue of doubt uh, and gloom, cause them to speak with a tongue of hope and joy. Uh, Lord, if they've been acting foolish, cause them to act uh, worthy of your kingdom, worthy of a son, worthy of a daughter, worthy of somebody that's been changed by the power of Christ's uh, sacrifice and resurrection. And Father, those that lifted up their hand just a few minutes ago, uh, I pray a powerful impartation come upon their life uh, and a zeal like they have never known uh, in the entirety of their life. Uh, let it stir them. Let it stir them uh, unto good works in your kingdom. Uh, in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Uh, amen and amen.